Good morning, everyone. Um, like you say, uh, there's quite a, quite a few titles, different titles and, and whatnot, but I wanted to share a little bit about the Suquamish tribe from uh, first contact to present day, what we're doing today. And then my involvement, um, what she didn't say is I have uh, been working with the tribe for 45 years. So I've seen a lot of, a lot of the development of the tribe. <laughs> Doug Swept, we're uh, known for people of the clear salt water. Um, this petroglyph is um, at the north end of Bainbridge Island. Um, and that paddle uh, up here um, is uh, in our tribal council chambers. And I believe that's maybe taken off a, a Jeff head. Um, the Suquamish tribe uh, have lived here for at least 10,000 years, archeological sites. Port Orchard, Bremerton, Suquamish, um, place names uh, uh, for, from our Suquamish leaders, of course, um, Seattle uh, is named after Chief Silk, uh, Chief Kitsap, and Chief uh, Chico. And as you can see, all the different little village sites, um, you know, um, around the uh, peninsula, the Salish Sea. And today we have um, just under like 1,200 uh, enrolled tribal members. Uh, first contact. Uh, 1792, uh, Captain uh, George Vancouver anchors off the, the shores of Suquamish uh, near Bainbridge Island. Um, in 1855, it's almost like 169 years, I believe, um, the treaty was signed, the Point Elliott Treaty. Um, and uh, 1859, it was ratified and they established the Port Madison Indian Reservation. Um, in 1886, the reservation was divided into allotments. You know, and there's an interesting, you know, story with my family is that um, in my grandmother's transcripts, she talks about her father being approached by an Indian agent and uh, told him that he needed to send his kids to board, the boarding schools. And he told uh, the Indian agent that these kids are my responsibility and they're going to go where I, where I go. And so he left the reservation and went into um, Bremerton. So that's where I grew up. Um, this is the reservation, um, just, just about 7,600 acres, um, but under you know, tribal government is about 1,500 acres. Uh, individual tribal members that got their allotments, about 25, and then non that got um, you know, sold off or what have you, um, about 3,500. And it's been a goal of the tribe you know, with the enterprises to try to buy back as much of that reservation as, as we can. Um, you know, there's um, what they call a checkerboard reservation, um, where uh, if it's fee property, uh, it's under um, county zoning. Um, if it's owned by the government, federal government, um, it's called trust land. Um, and then it falls under uh, tribal, um, the, the tribal government, um, as you can see. The tribal lands are subject to federal land use requirements. Okay, here we go. Um, we're governed by a, a seven-member uh, council elected by our membership. Um, and uh, March, um, you know, is when we have our general council. And um, my daughters think I'm crazy, but I'm going to um, try for one more term uh, to try to get me into my retirement. Um, you know, uh, so, um, you know, my, my kids, my older kids were trying to talk me out. I said, Dad, you need to retire. <laughs> I've been elected to tribal council for over 25 years, you know, along with my, you know, 45 years of employment with the tribe. Um, we have, uh, you know, formal government relations with Mayor Jaiman, Bremerton, Paulsbo. And then again, back in 2017, uh, City Vision Magazine featured the Squamish tribe in Paulsbo for their MOU. Um, you know, as an example, how tribes and cities uh, can work together. Uh, Suquamish uh, in Kitsap County agreed to a historic, um, you know, public uh, safety MOU, and I, and the reason it's historic is because there was a lot uh, a, a federal ruling that affected all the tribes across the United States, which was called Olivant uh, versus Suquamish tribe, and it was uh, a non-native um, that had gotten into some trouble on the reservation. Um, our tribal police, you know, pursued and arrested them, and it just went all through the court. Um, the U.S. and it was appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that 
um, the tribes don't have jurisdiction over non-natives on the reservation. And so uh, that affected all the tribes across the country. And so, and it created, you know, um, you know, just a lot of issues. Um, the tribal, the, the sheriff's department didn't recognize our tribal police. There wasn't, a, you know, and so a lot of that has changed now. So I'm happy to say. Um, let's see, Washington State, um, uh, we're governed by a centennial accord, you know, and so every year the, um, the governor meets with the tribes and all the departments and talk over issues and concerns um, with the tribal leaders. Um, and of course we have for formal government relations with the federal agencies uh, established by treaty. And yes, treaties are still in effect. People don't understand that, um, you know, that um, the treaties say the supreme law of the land, you know, and, um, but yet they're, they're challenged every day. Um, the tribal government, you know, we have a number of departments with our, because of sovereign, you know, we have our court system, our police. Um, human services, sports rec, legal, you, you name it. Um, the government has about uh, 354 employees, you know, between, you know, environmental biologists, engineers, accountants, social workers, teachers, and they're not all native, you know. So anytime you're looking for a job, I think the casino has probably got over probably 100 jobs available. Here's some signs of um, progress. You know, in 2009, we hosted a canoe journey. And we had about 8,500 people, you know, paddle to Suquamish, where we hosted them for about a week. Um, not an easy task, <laughs> but um, the the House of Wigan Culture um, was built um, to in order to host that event. Um, of course, then we have the the Mary, uh, Marion Forsman Boucher uh, Early Learning Center. Um, you know, that's our chairman, Leonard Forsman's sister. Uh, she was an incredible uh, woman. I, I was fortunate enough to be able to work with her. Um, and then, of course, the Suquamish Dock was also built to help host that uh, canoe journey. Again, signs of progress. You know, we had gotten these, um, you know, memorials built. Um, you know, um, at the Veterans Memorial, Chief uh, Silt Gravesite. Um, and then, of course, we, we built uh, a museum which if you haven't seen it, we'd love to, to, to have you come visit. Um, yeah, more signs of progress, it's like almost seafoods. Um, you know, we used to, to uh, harvest gooey duck and we're talking, you know, 300, 350,000 pounds of gooey duck and we'd bring it back to the shop, which was just a little lean to <laughs> and package it up and, and head to the airport. Um, now we got a, uh, just a beautiful seafood um, uh, building um, and we're still going out and harvest it, packing it up and heading it out, but it's a little bit nicer building. Um, the fitness um, youth center, um, you know, uh, this is, I wish I was a kid again. Um, it's, it's amazing if you haven't seen it. Um, this was built because one of our tribal council members at the time said uh, the casino was looking to expand and you'll see some of that in the slides, but he says, well, I'm not going to approve your expansion unless you get some money to build a youth center. So that's how that was built, you know. So the casino borrowed more money, you know, and was able to build this, you know, for, you know, um, uh, the, the, the youth, and it is absolutely gorgeous. You know, um, here is um, the MV uh, Suquamish, the new ferry. I'd say not so new now, I guess, you know, but, um, you know, we got to go over there and, and witness um, the first welds with uh, the governor and our chairman. Um, uh, he did a pretty good job. <laughs> it's still floating. <laughs> um, here's, there's just a little bit of a snapshot of what the um, tribal uh, businesses contribute, um, you know, to the economy. Um, you know, 68.2 million in wages and benefits to employees. Um, 74, you know, million uh, in goods and services purchased. You know, and then some of the capital projects, which you'll see, you know, between 11 and 12 million dollars just for capital projects. Um, you know, some of the government owned businesses, of course, Port Madison Enterprises. And I'll tell you a little bit about the history on how that was established, Suquamish Seafoods. And then some of the privately owned businesses are just the you know, coffee shop and some of the, the, the um, fireworks stands. 
Um, Port Madison Enterprise established in uh, 1987 because the tribe uh, government couldn't go to the bank and secure loans because of our sovereign immunity. Because it, you know the banks couldn't come and collect the property. So we established uh, Port Madison Enterprise and uh, a, you know, um, and a, the council, tribal council appointed uh, seven members to sit on this board. When, and what they were able to do is sign a limited waiver of sovereign immunity. So look, you recognize this person. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in 74, the first business were open, uh, one of the smoke shops. Um, you know, then closed because they were challenged. The state said that, you know, um, we couldn't sell our tax, uh, our tribal tax cigarettes um, because we didn't package it. We didn't put anything into it. Um, and so that uh, lawsuit was uh, lost and, and so um, we had to shut down the smoke shops. Um, this is my son who's now, I think, probably 40 years old, I think. <laughs> um, you know, um, and again, this tells about the history of, um, you know, Port Madison Enterprises being established. You know, and the uh, Port Madison Enterprise, an agency of the Squamish Tribal Government, created in 1970 to develop um, community resources while promoting the economic and social welfare of the Squamish Tribe through commercial activities. And I am so pleased to, to say that um, this has just been incredible for the tribe. You know, um, it's unfortunate that we had to, to do a workabout to, in order to do that, but um, we did. Um, this was the first um, casino. I referred to it as the Twinkie. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and um, you know, it got us by till we were able to, to build uh, the new facility. <coughs> Um, these are uh, a number of the enterprises um, that the tribe owns. Of course, the Clearwater Casino Resort, Kayana Lodge, which I, I ran for about 15 years, uh, White Horse Golf Course, which um, we acquired on my birthday, I don't know how many years ago now. So I was so happy when I toured it, um, uh, when, when we were going through the process of acquiring it. Um, property management, um, we leased some buildings. Um, then the PME Retail, and then we have our uh, Suquamish Evergreen, our cannabis store, and then um, our construction company um, that's uh, just doing extremely well. Um, here's some of the uh, pictures of the casino upgrades, and then again, when these upgrades were approved, that's when we got money to build the, uh, the Family Fitness Center. Um, and then uh, White Horse, um, when we acquired it, it, it just had a a single wide um, trailer for their clubhouse and so um, you know we were able to build a beautiful you know clubhouse and and so proud of um, what we've been able to do with that piece of property you know it's it was I guess the acquisition was looking at um, acquiring over 300 acres of um, property on that to just so happen to have a golf course so um, and then of course Cayenne Lodge uh, it's been an award-winning uh, uh, banquet and catering facility. It's probably r rated the top three, um, um, you know, uh, wedding facilities in the whole state of Washington. That's something we're pretty proud of. And then, of course, here's the, the golf course. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's just been a tremendous acquisition for the tribe. Oh, you're going backwards. Oh, and then here we go with the... Uh, uh, the construction company, um, you know, a lot of our development, we were having to hire some local construction and it was like, geez, why don't, you know, we kind of own a company where we can pay ourselves. And so um, it, 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 it's been a, we had a, to kind of bail the construction company out for a while, but, um, but I'm happy to say that a lot of the uh, government contracts that they're getting um, through the Navy and whatnot, um, they're doing extremely well. Um, here's a snapshot of some employment, you know, um, the numbers uh, um, have definitely got down since the pandemic, um, you know, and I don't, you know, I, I kind of question, you know, the government that, that we shouldn't have lost so many of the employees during that pandemic, you know, because there was ARPA dollars that we, we could have, um, we, you know, used in order to keep those staff on, you know, but, um, 
but paying health benefits and things like that when they're not bringing in revenue was, you know, a, a tough decision to do. But, but I've, I've been finding that um, it's been real difficult to try to get that workforce um, built back up. You know, the stores that I started in, um, you know, that, uh, you know, sh should be open, you know, on Saturday, they were shutting down at eight o'clock in the evening because you didn't have staff to be able to keep them open, you know, on Friday, Saturday nights, which is just crazy to think of. Um, you know, um, we have uh, what they call a, a, an Appendix X, which is um, part of the agreement with the state is that we had to put a certain percentage of uh, money aside for nonprofits. Um, and so this is just a snapshot of some of the contributions that have been made um, that uh, nonprofits every quarter the Suquamish tribe you can apply if you're a nonprofit 501c3 you can apply for these funds and it's no guarantee but I do sit on the committee that oversees those <laughs> those applications so and then um, I guess with that the hush guy and that's thank you um, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about this warm vest, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the tribe would treat the, uh, our elders to a, a trip, you know, annually, and we got to go up to Alaska. So we went up to Alaska and we're looking around and uh, some of these shops and I, I went into a shop that, um, you know, looked like it had more authentic and you couldn't be more authentic than looking at the inside of what materials they used. To, but. Um, I seen uh, my wife seen this vest up there, and oh man, that's pretty nice. It'd be nice to have, and and I didn't see what the price on was it, but it was pretty pretty pricey. But the lady says, well, just make me an offer, you know. Well, I thought it might have been uh, like a two hundred and fifty dollar vest, you know. So I said, well, what about a hundred and fifty bucks? And then she said, do you know how much that? You know, it was like four hundred and fifty dollars, you know. And but um, you know. We were able to negotiate. I felt so bad because I would not <laughs> have made a, an offer like that if I knew it was like, you know, $450. But we, we got it. Yeah. So now, in 2018, uh, I was lucky enough to go um, to the U.S. Supreme Court, highest court in the nation, you know, to hear the culvert case. And you see all the construction that's going on and they're, you know, replacing these culverts with, um, with bridges. And so I got to hear the case. And I'm sitting in... Uh, well, I'm trying to get into the to, the to the courthouse, and the first thing is they made me take this off because they felt it was a weapon, so I had to take that off and I had to go find a locker to put it in. Um, but now I, I'm I'm in the courtroom and I'm just thinking, oh man, this is incredible. And I'm sitting in the back of the courtroom, and then this U.S. Marshal comes up and says, "Can I speak with you a minute?" You know, I said, "Well, yeah." You know, so we get up and we go to the back of the courtroom. And he goes, well, tell you, could you tell me about the vest? And I go, well, I thought he was admiring it. So I said, well, it's got mother pro buttons all the way around it. It's all beaded around the designs, you know. And then he goes, well, we're trying to keep the courtroom impartial. You may be asked to cover it up or remove it. I said, okay, you know. He left. I sat back down. You know, he comes back five minutes later. And he says, yeah, if you could, you know, if you could, um, you know, cover it up or take it off, that'd be great. So I took it off, folded it up, put it in my lap, and I sat down. He left. And then he comes back five minutes later and says, could you follow me? And I had to take this out, this vest off, and follow him out to the U.S. Marshal's office and hand over my vest. So this was in 2018. I don't know. I did not wear this, you know, to, to protest. Um, you know, it does have a, a salmon in the back. You know, and that, of course, was, you know, part of the, the court case was, you know, to try to, to save the salmon. I, again, I did not wear it, um, anything, but I thought it looked good. You know, I was representing my tribe. Um, and so if you can understand how, you know, how that made me feel after the fact, you know, I complied. I didn't want to, you know, draw any attention, you know. Um, <coughs> But after the fact, when I think about, um, you know, who made that decision on whether or not I, could, I should be able to wear this or not, you know, was it him himself, you know, was it, you know, the attorneys for the state, you know, was it someone in the, um, you know, in the, in the U.S. Supreme Court? Um, we'll never know, you know. I'm happy to say that we won the, won the case and they're, they're having to replace those, those culverts, so, but... Um, that's a little story about, you know, 
you know, this vest and, um, you know, it'll always, I guess, be a part of history. Because um, I guess there was a, a, um, a Yakima native that had his full headdress and his, you know, um, regalia. Uh, and he couldn't even get into the courtroom. So, you know. But that's a little bit about the tribe, a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, I guess we'll turn it over to the next presentation. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jay. Yeah. I understand it's his birthday today. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Oh, no. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jay. Happy birthday, Jay. Happy birthday, Jay. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I couldn't make it with that. What better place to spend a birthday? <laughs> yeah, nice. Oh, good work. Uh, as we continue our journey of reflection, appreciation and unity, we now welcome Clarence Moore Walkie. Clarence Moore Walkie is a member of the Bainbridge oh. Island City Council, Thank you. past president of the Bainbridge Island Japanese American Community, and founder and past president of the Bainbridge Island Japanese American Exclusion Memorial Association. He was a leader in the creation of the Exclusion Memorial on Bainbridge Island and its designation as a National Historic Site. Clarence has held responsible positions for President Bill Clinton, Governor Mike Lowry, Congressman Jay Inslee, the Washington State, and more. He was the CEO of the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Washington and was a Tequila City Council member, a broadcast journalist with three Seattle radio stations, and he is our state's first and only 12-year-old Eagle Scout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to put the starter here. Um, is this my line? Yep. Yes. Okay. I segue with this always in my presentations. Thank you. Chief South, namesake of Sydney, Seattle. They've been here for 10,000 years. And he already mentioned Captain George Vancouver coming here the very first Europeans in central Puget Sound, the Salish Sea. And what they discovered here, um, and actually the, after, that was 1792 and 1841, Captain, James, Captain Wilkes came to the island, circled it, named it after his good friend Commodore William Bainbridge who never set foot in Washington State. <laughs> and th what they found here were these natural resources, these huge logs, and the Blakely Harbor uh, was the largest mill in the world at its time. And also, another business, uh, the uh, port uh, shipyard. And these brought in people from all around the world, Swedes, Norwegians, Croatians, Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos. And they are very important because they all had to work together. No one cared about your background. You, you trusted your neighbors, your friends to take care of you, watch you in safety. Uh, the Census Bureau came in the late 19th century and you couldn't understand nor want to spell names like Mori Waki. And so for many years, the Census Bureau simply called you uh, Jap number one or Jap number two. This is what it looked like at the turn of the century, 19th century, early 20th century. I'm gonna focus on the very left of that map and these are the pioneer villages of Yama and Nagaya. This is where the Japanese lived and uh, brought their families together. Nagaya was where the f they first worked. Then when the woman came over and had families, they built that up in the hill. And Yama means um, hill or mountain in Japanese. And took a lot of pride. And this is Yama. They built all of their lumber uh, from lumber from the mill and, and salvage materials. And they took a lot of pride in their properties. They had businesses. They created all of the company towns, the Washington Hotel, the mercantile store, the, the bathhouse. And the most popular one that they made was the ice cream parlor. Um, and what this did was it brought all the people in and they got to uh, patronize the Japanese businesses, again, creating that very tight community, which is really critical to how Bainbridge Island was formed. After the mill burned down, they had to do something else. And so a lot of the Japanese took um, uh, dynamite from World War I surplus blowing up all these stumps and started strawberry farms and they were the most prosperous strawberry farms in the area. Another thing that Bainbridge Island did that was unusual was they had compulsory public education before the state of Washington even required it. This is another feature that made this island really tight-knit because I would contend that no child is born prejudice. This is something that's learned and so the values were brought here and so this community was really working very well. And then uh, this happened in December 7th, 1941. The Imperial Forces of Japan came to Pearl Harbor and bombed the fleet. 
On that day, the FBI went to 23 cities and uh, the place of Hawaii, and they gathered up more, nearly 1,300 Japanese Americans without any search warrants, without any charges. On February 4th, they came to Bainbridge Island, and with the assistance of the Kitsap County Sheriff's Department and Washington State Patrol, they raided all 50 homes simultaneously. And I want you to think about, you know, we've got GPS and we can't coordinate our times to get together at the restaurant. They did that in 1942. So they had actionable intelligence and they took away 30 of our elders. And this is a map of that day. This is December 7th. Uh, on December 7th, you can see that, if you can see that, 7.30 a.m. December 9th, 1941. So they already had this planned out for quite a while because they had been surveilling every person of Japanese ancestry, the 116th Japanese. The FBI had these plans for that. A few months after that, this is just uh, three days ago, four days ago, was the 82nd anniversary of President Franklin Roosevelt signing this executive order, and it set in motion the removal of Japanese, and everybody had to register on Bainbridge Island. This is at the, um, it's called, now called a Pegasus Coffee Shop. It was the Anderson Hardware Store. This is a picture of Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Ivansto Eroto, and they're smiling here, but I suspect shortly after that they were not because he was informed since he is a Filipino-American, he could not go with his wife, who was Miki, and a Japanese-American. And he said, I will do anything. I will renounce my citizenship. I just want to be my wife. But when they were removed, he had to stay back on the island. Everybody on the island, because it was so tight-knit, they had someone look after their properties, and that was very unusual as well. And uh, so when the, 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 uh, the oh, yeah, I forgot to mention, you could not own property if you weren't a U.S. citizen. And all the first Japanese Americans could not apply for citizenship. That was not allowed until 1951, and yet they owned property because their children are U.S. citizens by birthright. So we literally had five-year-old landlords on the island. <laughs> the day finally came where they had to be removed. They all gathered at the, at the Eagle Dell Ferry Dock. It was a very, again, tight-knit community. A lot of the high school seniors came to say goodbye to their friends. And the soldiers in those six days of waiting became very close to the community. You can see here they took care of them. And Walt Woodward, who was the publisher of the Bainbridge Island Review and the editor at the time, he, he talked to the commanding officer and he noticed that the commanding officer said, we don't know why we're here. We don't know why we're doing this. This is the hardest thing we've ever had to, had to do. And he said all the soldiers had tears in their eyes. This is a picture of the Mojis. Uh, they had their pet dog, um, King. He was very well known. But that was their child, but he could not go with them. So he had to stay. The Mojis had their friends take after their, look after their property. They held King back as the truck was driven away. And this five-year-old dog was uh, so despondent that uh, he refused to eat or drink, and he died in a week. This is the day they removed, were taken down to the Eagle Dale Ferry Dock. This is where the memorial is uh, created today. And they went over to Seattle, where they now boarded trains. Uh, people said it was the most humiliating experience of their life. They rode in these trains uh, for three days and two nights and arrived in California at Lone Pine. And they traveled on a bus for another few hours. And they arrived here at Manzanar, a concentration camp under construction, on April Fool's Day, 1942. These barracks were fast put together. They were basically very large sheds, 100 feet by 20, broken up into four apartments. So it's about 25 by 20, one bare light bulb, cots, and the first several hundred had to fill them up with straw, these big bags, and that would be your mattress and your pillow, and one stove, and groups of up to eight people would live in this 20 by 25 area. This is a picture of Manzanar, it's full build out. This is at the Japanese American National Museum, and it had about uh, 10,000 people. You can see these blocks, and this would be the main dining hall. These would be the men and women's latrine, and a, and a um, laundry facility. You can see the exclusion zone in Washington, it was the Columbia River, north of, Can north of Canada. In Oregon, it was the Bend, as well as out the Hood River, and all of California. If you're 116th Japanese American, you're going to be taken away, placed in one of these concentration camps. That was 114,000 people. Another 6,000 children were born in one of these 10 facilities. All told, that was 120,000, or about 95% of all Japanese Americans on the United States. And here are the, the camps right here. The Manzanar. For example, uh, the place in uh, Top uh, Heart Mountain, Wyoming, that was the largest city in Wyoming at the time. It was that place. During the war, 
they came and asked the Japanese Americans to fight for our country. A lot of them did. They, there was many units. One was called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the most decorated unit of any at size and duration in Amer American history. There was also the Military Intelligence Service that t fought in, in Japan and uh, against the Japanese. That's where my father was from. But even with that, they came and asked people to apply, and then they drafted. But you still had, they didn't trust your, your loyalty. So they had them fill out a questionnaire, and they had them ask these two questions. You can look at the first one, and many of them said, well, I might, if you would give me my liberties, that would I be standing for, if you let my family out of this barbed wire camp. And the second one, they thought it was a catch question, because they said, I don't even know who the emperor is, let alone any loyalty to Japan. And if you forswear, it implies that you had previous allegiance. So therefore, it was a catch question. And some people who said no to either one of these questions were considered disloyal and placed in a special segregation camp in, in Wyoming. All of the Japanese Americans on Bainbridge did say yes, yes, and, and fought in the war. Um, this is Harry Truman after giving the, the units and, and the government give uh, what's called a, a presidential citation, presidential unit citation. Only about 5% of groups, ships, whatever, get one of these awards. This is a picture when he awarded the seventh presidential unit citation to the 442nd. And he said, you not only fought the enemy, you fought prejudice and you won. We were also at war with our countries, of course, these two others. And yet there was no forced removal of any of these groups. There were about 10, 000, 10, 10, 000, there were about 10 million, million uh, Germans and about 4 million Italian nationals. They arrested about 10,000 German nationals and about 4,000 Italian nationals. All of them had something. They had a suspicion, conviction, or charge of some sort of crime against America. Not one was ever done for any Japanese American. And if it had been Italians, this Italian probably couldn't have continued being the Yankee Clipper. <coughs> or this German American would not become the, f the leader of the Allied forces and a Republican president after the war. Dwight Eisenhower, of course. Now, I said it was unconstitutional, and J. Edgar Hoover, who was the FBI guy who did all these raids on the, on the Japanese families, he said, I got nothing, Mr. President. And that's when he went out and arrested 10,000 Germans and that. And the Attorney General of the United States said, they're U.S. citizens. The children are born here. This is unconstitutional, Mr. President. And yet, they got, they got in. And these are what they're talking about. The Fifth Amendment is very powerful. You know, you have to have a search warrant. All your property is there. Not one search warrant was ever measured. The fifth one is very important. You hear this one a lot because that's where you can't testify against yourself. But it's, read it, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Even though the first generation Japanese weren't citizens, they're still people. They still qualify as people. And then the 14th Amendment is the Equal Protection Amendment. And it's, this is the, this is the uh, citizen lottery. This, you're born in America, you're an American citizen. Two-thirds of these uh, third of people were American citizens, the children and yet it was upheld constitutionally with the Supreme Court. How were they able to do that if you're a person, if you're a citizen? And it was in these um, documents. It said this line, all persons, alien and non-alien, shall be evacuated. And the Supreme Court said, in times of war, you can be reclassified. And so you are no longer a person. The government now can consider you an alien. And the American citizens are no longer American citizens. You're a non-alien. And by that definition, that was one of the linchpins they could say, well, this is a constitutional provision. And you know this story, right? Fear drove a lot of hatred. And you saw a lot of this during World War II. After 9-11, we saw the same kind of reactions. The Germans in World War I were incredible propagandists. They took it to a new art form. Look at the Bolshevik. Of course, he's always dark and big and threatening this woman. And that's one way because you are not, unless you're a sociopath or a psychopath, we don't kill on demand. That's not in our nature. And yet you have to get soldiers motivated to do that. So how you do that is you get them to hate the other. And you can do that by making them evil like this or you can make them non-human like that. This is the coming across the channel. Look at, he's got Uncle Sam by toe in his web over here. Um, and we said, this was so awful. This was something that the United States and our values would not stand for. Dehumanizing, demeaning, it was below our standards. And yet when World War II started, we had these posters. By the way, almost all these posters are US government funded images. 
and after 9-11. When I give this presentation to kids, they have no idea who the hell this is. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know what this is. Millions coming, they have to come every, once in their lifetimes, a Muslim must make their pilgrimage to Mecca. Folks all know who Dr. Seuss is, right? The next image I'm gonna show you was something that was very popular during the war. It was something that, you know, we wear, some people wear flag lapel pins or yellow ribbons to show your patriotism. These were used to show your patriotism. They were given away by churches, organizations, civic clubs, universities. And this was given to our Marines after they passed their marksman classes. In 1980, they finally established a commission to look into the history of this. And under President Ronald Reagan, the Wartime Commission on the Impairment of Civilians, they came up with this report, Personal Justice Denied. And they had, in the stat, they said, what happened? So they looked into all the history of this, and then they said, here's their ultimate finding. It was unanimous. And they said, it was based on race prejudice, war hysteria, and a lack of political leadership. And I also know that there was never any charges or anything of that sort. This is what Dr. Kinomoto, our longtime president, says. And I think this is true. Fear is something that you do when you want, um, you motivate people. You, it creates hate that never hate existed before. I challenge any of you. On September 10th, 2001, did you even know what a Muslim was? Or what Islam was? I mean, you might know that Muhammad Ali became an, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And on September 11th, they, came, they became our enemy in an instant. And they weren't the four, because it's fear. Fear is a powerful motivator. I tell kids, you know, fear is something that is inherent in you. It gives you supercharged abilities. If, if there's a fire, adrenaline pumps your body up and you can run. And, you know, if there's a storm coming, you move. That gets your body going. But a body politic, a body of nations having that fear, you can't sustain that. It, it, the body can't sustain that energy. And so you release it by trying to blame someone else. That happens all the time. You lost your job, blame the Mexicans. You always, you always have to, thank you, my time. Um, this is the motivator and this is our motto. Bainbridge Island was that place that stood by their friends and neighbors. More than 150 came back out of the 276. Not one community came close to 20% because they had that. And more people would have come back if they um, even had far farms to come back to. And this is our motto because we want this to be um, inspirational to you. And it's certainly aspirational, but um, it's not happening. When the pandemic hit, people who looked like me, we were the cause of the pandemic. Suddenly, everyone's got someone to blame, and it's fearful. We had that, it was a deadly virus. It killed millions in, a, in our United States. So who has to blame? And so blame some, blame the Chinese. They called it the Kung flu, right? The Chinese virus. Um, so while it is aspirational, we're falling short. And so what you have to be is be like Bainbridge Island. You know, they stood by their friends and neighbors even in the face of all of the criticism, Walt Woodward was the only newspaper, the Bainbridge Review, that stood in, on behalf of the Japanese Americans, and he opposed the unconstitutional actions of the President of the United States. He's the only newspaper in the entire war who did that consistently. And that allowed a, a place of safety and feeling that the community had their, had their community back, and that's why so many were able to come back. So that's the inspiration I think you should take from this story. It was a bad thing our government did, but Bainbridge Islands had a different standard of how you treat your friends and neighbors and citizens. And that's all I could leave with. Thank you very much.